Hey, you're welcome. I can see Messman Moafo is already online. Messman, you're welcome. I appreciate the fact that you're taking out time to listen to a very hard conversation and a difficult conversation on racism. Get your knee off our necks. And uh, today we are having uh, our expert, a brilliant lady. I mean, she's doing an amazing job, um, Elizabeth Holeman. And she's talking today on the topic, African parents prefer to ignore racism and use avoidance strategy. What do you think? Is that your point of view? If you're listening, wherever you are, let us here indicate that you are already online so we can uh, continue the conversation together. Remember, this is your platform. This is our space. We come here to heal. We come to talk. We vent with one another. And then we get into strategic talking. We heal ourselves. And of course, after being healed, we get empowered to do and to take the actions that those actions that could lead for uh, to positive changes. Up to now, we have had great experts. Up to now, we had uh, Rahimi Diallo, who gave us the four main strategies and points, how racism has been structurized. And he said that it is an ideology, the ideology of the white supremacy. And this ideology, has been transformed into structures and uh, these structures could be seen in the literature in schools and the police and the diverse offices the laws and of course the worst part of this um ideology is the fact that it has been so engraved in the heart of the black man black woman as well as the white man the white woman the white man woman believes that he she is superior to the white man and the black woman and the black person has believed the lies that were told about him or about her but we didn't stop the conversation there because, of course, like I said before, this space is a space to talk, but a space also of healing. And that's why we brought also with us uh, a, an expert, a trauma expert, Mrs. Abeke, who taught us exactly how um, racism affects us and affects our growth. For you who is listening, I want you to understand that indeed we as Black people can do all things we are able we are capable and have all the potentials to do exceedingly even more than what we can ever imagine but because of the white ideology the white supremacy the white thoughts and thinking and patterns it was transmitted into us in the subconscious mind and for those who are maybe reading the bible who say into the spirit to believe that we're not able to do and therefore the system and the strategy of the oppressor has always been to put fear and total submission onto us so that we must submit to their concept. And that takes us to the discussion we had last week with Maria Kaina, who went right deep into the conversation and told us and gave us a history. It was a history time with Maria Kaina. And I want you to go really search for the book, The Great Race uh, from Grant. It is in Amazon. And this was for Hitler, a Bible. He used that as a Bible to uh, destroy actually um the jews so and and so i really appreciate all the experts we have been having up to now but today we are having a dynamic expert another kind and another dimension and she says african parents or african people in general prefer to ignore the topic of racism prefer to ignore the conversation of racism and they choose the avoidance strategy. And that's why we are going to be finding out how true is this or how not true is this. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to be very active, take active part in the conversation 
bring out your point of views because after this we are going to bring out all these experts who put all what they have said into a book so that we can be able to use it and like sila said some time ago to have an unbiased history presented to our children so that our children know what we have done so far to fight this battle welcome with me ladies and gentlemen our speaker for today elizabeth holeman elizabeth you're welcome how are you today ma'am i'm doing very fine and yourself how are you doing i'm doing very well i have been having different uh conversations today different zoom meetings and um i think that with the COVID 19 it has taught us that um we really do not need a space or working again we can work from the comfort of our homes and uh, still do the work we must do but what about you elizabeth how are you today you have a very challenging topic you know that how yes. are you today I'm doing very fine. I had a pretty busy day today. Uh, just been jumping from one online event to the other. Uh, yeah, so a really busy day. Mm -hmm. So this is your platform, Elizabeth. You said that African parents or African families prefer the avoidance strategy. How true is this? So I welcome you to give us your 15 minutes presentation. And after that, we are going to be having questions and answers. Also questions from the our viewers. And uh, of course, I have prepared my questions for you. This is your platform. Take care. Yes. Of the okay. Yeah, good evening, viewers. And uh, Vera, thank you so much for asking me to be one of your, your guests on the platform. And I really appreciate this because this is also another opportunity for me to be able to give out some, uh, you know, some of those information that maybe some people out there may not have been aware of. My name is Elizabeth Horleman. I am a diversity and communication management trainer, in, trainer and I also I am a cognitive life coach. And in addition to that, I offer white people uh, critical whiteness and white privilege workshops and an advanced uh, platform, which is the Race Think Dinner. Now, before I start, I'd like to just say that the first time I introduced my concept of the Race Think Dinner, where I called a spade a spade, and I said in this concept, this time I don't want to focus on the victims of, of racism. I'd like to focus on the perpetrators or those people who are the racists themselves to find out uh, whether they know, and if they know, what are they doing? Are they interested in doing? And I must admit, it was like throwing a tear gas in the room, although it was online. And I noticed that most people went off and unfriended me and the discussions or communication with me went very, very thin. And, um, and in addition to that, as I was going to war with the on racism, I realized that um, I was right ahead and there was nobody behind me or very few people behind me needed to find out why it was. And I came to realize that we are not all on one page in terms of, of racism. Some of us are complete in denial. And those are the people that I'm going to talk about. It is like a book. If you have a book, there are some people who know that there is a book on the shelf. They've seen it, but uh, for reasons best for some reasons, legitimate or not, they will not take up that book in their hand. They will just leave it on the shelf, either in the, in the bookstores or wherever it is. There are some that have actually bought the book. They open the first page. Uh, they read up to the foreword. They've not gone to the, you know, reading the inside of the book. Some have read page one. Those are the ones that are maybe going to start those discussions. Now, my, my reason for uh, coming and talking about this is because I have a lot of children who are following me actually on Instagram are children, both uh, both mixed uh, race children. I just want to use that word now for lack of a better word. And our children that are, let's say, that are black, that have issues about how their parents are navigating around the discussions on racism. Not, not really right now, because I started this even before the George Floyd. And uh, they, they have problems that their parents are... Um, I would call it denial on why they are not really addressing the issues of racism. Now, I've got uh, some uh, observations that I have done, 
And the first thing is when I'm looking at the diaspora African is that when we leave our country, we leave our country to come here and uh, we're coming in the land of opportunity. And in this land of opportunity, we come to realize that the, the situation is much different from what we have it at home. It is easier to get your insurance. It is easier to get whatever you think you, you had a right to. You are going to maybe experience one or two challenges, but you're going to get it and you do not need to maybe pay money for it. So, you you know, it kind of appreciate that. I remember somebody, uh, one person coming up to my Instagram and telling me uh, this information that I'm giving people is not for Germany. It is just for the U.S. Angela Merkel is a very nice person. She welcomed us. We don't need to, you know, we are so grateful that she welcomed us, that we are not, we don't need to talk about racism. We don't need to make white people feel uncomfortable. They are very kind here. So such like comments is what really made me a bit worried uh, to find out exactly why is it that we don't talk about racism. And that is the reason why I started off these discussions. I continue. So the land of the the land of the opportunity. You make your way to to whichever country that you want to go to, and you actually do establish yourself in that country. But because we've come back from a background where we have always been told that white people are superior, and you really come in and you see the things that are being done here are why much uh, developed than that that you that you've been seeing in your own country. So you kind of like uh, do believe that the, uh, the the country that you are in is highly, much more highly developed than your country without actually finding out the background reasons as to why we are there the way that we are and they are here the way that they are here. So if we are denying racism and we have our children, we are not making their lives easier. I want us to go to a setup where you went to school maybe back home where everybody was black right the issue about your your color was not and was not not an issue at all but now you are sending your children to a school to an institution where number one they may be the only black people and recently i learned that philosoph philosophers such as immanuel kant who is a terribly or highly racist person is one that even the teacher uses in the presence of these black children, how do they manage to cope? And the, who do they look out for in terms of where can I talk about this? How I'm, I am hurting. My parents are really not understanding the microaggressions that are taking place in terms of uh, me being in school. And apart from that, I'm not really, me as a child, I'm not really understanding what is it that this teacher keeps on referring to me and I'm not feeling comfortable about it. And why is it that my parents are not understanding me? I'm always hearing them saying, we should be grateful, we are here. We should not, you know, this is their country. We should lie low like envelopes. Uh, racism is not like that. But you see, racism in, in terms of understanding is not just something that you're seeing visibly. We always use the iceberg to explain uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the above the ice what is above the water and what is below the water. This is what brought the Titanic down. Now, this iceberg is used in so many setups. You can use it in, communi in, in intercultural communication. You can use it in conflict. And you can also use it in terms of understanding what is racism. So most of the African people, what they know is if I see somebody who has maybe bald head with those shoes, with white shoelaces, then I know navigate away from that person, avoid eye contacts, get onto the other side of the road. Or we have like the time in 2000, I think 2006, where somebody from South Africa started a website called the no-go areas. So we navigate against those no-go areas. We don't want to get involved. We don't want to get deeper to know or to understand what is this racism that is going on. Our, our strategy is to avoid yeah so we try we look at only the above what is above the water the afd and the ndps and you know the csu i think the nsu sorry that are above there those are the things that we see but at the bottom this is what nature's racism and this is what i find a problem that 
most Africans are not going to want to get to the bottom of this to understand. Because number one, there are also issues that I've come to realize that people who come from a country that has been oppressing people in their own country, when they come here, they too have problems with now looking and understanding. This looks familiar to me at home. My people or people like myself oppress others. I'm seeing some, you know, some similarities as what is going on there. It's just maybe the name is different here. It's called racism. But back home, we are calling it something else. So this is something that is conflicting that if somebody does not know, how do I cope with the notion that most likely in my own country, I too was part of a system that was oppressing maybe others. So how do I cope here? How do I tell my children? How do I explain to my children who are suffering, have no idea of the setup back home, how it is? So then those are that is one one of the major points that uh, that I think that particularly parents who have children here that really need to look at uh, that issue. The other one which I find uh, comes actually historically is the one that we have religion. Uh, there's a very famous saying that uh, I forget the name of the, the person who said it. He said that the slaves were enslaved for almost 400 years. When they were freed, uh, when they came out of the, the enslavement, they found that the white men had already painted God white, Jesus white, Mary white, angels white, everybody white, and the devil was a different color. Somebody that looked at, like us. And we too, if you look at people's uh, profiles, some of the people's profiles, they have this white man that they are idealizing as, uh, as somebody that is white and, you know, uh, clean and has got no evils with them. So we are already uh, been, uh, we've already been uh, brainwashed to see that anything white is really pure, anything black is not good. So as we are also manifesting the supremacy, that is already being imposed in us. The supremacy that made us lose our cultures, the supremacy that made us lose our names, our languages. We gave all this up. There's a poem that says we gave you, we, we speak your language, we speak your German, we speak your Italian, we speak your, your English, and you speak our nothing. In return, they don't speak anything that we do. But it is very nice for us as brain some of the brainwashed people to speak even the english in the british american accent we love that we like that or we go in and name our children the way they name their children we we want to dress like them look like them egocentric egocentrism do their hairs like the way that they make their hairs so a lot of these other things that are we are ourselves manifesting by the sense that we are not accepting that there is, you know, this thing about racism, right? So that is another issue, the religion, which is something that is highly delicate, highly explosive in our communities. You do not say that God is not white. You want to call it a different color. I'm not sure which one, but that is one of the things that uh, brainwashing does in the religion where we have what is called the blind faith and we've integrated all what the white man has said to be Jesus white, uh, Mary white, and or the angels white. Interesting enough is that recently the 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 church in in Great Britain, the um, the evangelist or the Protestant church in Great Britain, apologized for this, and they are now sitting down to discuss on what colors to change those people that they are that made white. So you can see that how painful people can be or how hideous people can be. They they did it intentionally. And as a result of brainwashing the other people who now are finding themselves in a conflict situation as to if the God that we've been believe, uh, that we've been worshiping is not white, what color is he, right? That is when I'm going to talk also about the denial, uh, the denials that we have. Now, the, the, the other issue that we have with, uh, with ourselves is that we have a system where we we don't have a generational of wealth. The only generational of wealth that we see is the white man. And we believe for ourselves, the white man does things, he does it right. Look at them, they have all this generational wealth, they have societal 
wealth, they have, you know, all, all sorts of wealth, what we don't have. So in, in actual fact, what we do is we tell our children, how many of you have heard your parents say, uh, you must work 10 times harder, right? Interesting enough, white, white folks don't need to tell their children that. But as we've got set, set uh, uh, educational uh, um, backgrounds that we want our children to be, and they should not just be that, they should always work, work 10 times harder. Ironically is that we've never really gone in and understood how the racism system works. The racism system is a booby trap. You can work 10 times harder, but you will never be able to reach that top place, which is reserved just for them. If you do the racial pyramid, you're going to see the black skin is always at the bottom. So no matter how hard you're going to work, you're going to find that you're never going to get at the top. So denying that the, that racism does not exist and uh, and making and trying those efforts of getting up in the motto that they are fair, these people are fair. You see in Africa, people are not fair. You have to pay these. There's a lot of bribery. It kind of like, you know, washes off all the real truth, the deeper truth that we need to really be focused on finding out uh, and also, you know, readjusting the things that we've, in, the wrong things that we've internalized about ourselves. Now, Dr. Chika uh, Esibui, she's an education and indigenous knowledge uh, doctor. She told, she did one TED talk and she said that this denial of us denying ourselves did not just start the other the other day it starts also from our leaders when you when she did a ted talk she had that uh thing that you say a as in apple where the children learn the alphabet a as in apple now a as in apple she says is for those children that apple grows in their country in abundance at the time or even right now we have people that maybe apples grow in the countries, but this is not a widespread product that is in the country there. So the white man really get, went in and really whitewashed everything for us, so much so that we believe even that we can see that apple. We, when it is divided and presented to us with two halves, some of us would not have known that this is an apple until it was in a rounder form, in one form, and we see, you know, this is red apple or green apple. So our school system, as a matter of fact, is also another place where it has really manifested the idea that white is supreme, where we, we do not think that what they are doing is racism. We just think that what they are doing is correct simply because they are most knowledgeable, they are most superior, they have all the knowledge. And they can, you know, they can afford to do that. And as a matter of fact, if you're living here in the diaspora, your reason would be that, yeah, I mean, this is their country. Why shouldn't they do that? No. So those are the, for me, the four major points that I find is very important that we really look at in terms of uh, is there racism and to what extent do we, have we got the knowledge of what is racism? Thank you so very much, Elizabeth of uh, Holeman. Uh, but I will just go to Elizabeth today. I that was an impressive uh, talk. I want to read um, the definition of Negro so that our brothers and sisters, wherever they are, that they can listen to this um, definition. And if they can align with this definition, that okay, we can continue to deny the fact that it doesn't exist. But if this uh, definition can we quicken our minds and open our understanding then i think we can have a better conversation so in 1798 one of them went to define what negro is and it's so painful to hear it says the name given to a variety of human species who are entirely black and are found in the uh, torrid zone, especially in that part of Africa, which lies within the tropics. In the complexion of Negroes, we meet the various shades, but they likewise differ far from other men in all the features of their face, round cheeks, high cheekbones, a forehead somewhat elevated, a short, broad, flat nose, 
thick lips, small ears, ugliness, and irregularity of shape characterize their external appearance. The Negro women have the lions uh, greatly depressed and very large buttocks, which give the back the shape of a saddle. Um, vices the most notorious seem to be seem to be the portion of this unhappy race idleness treachery revenge cruelty imprudence stealing lying profanity debauchery nastiness and intemperance are said to have extinguished the principle of natural law and to have silenced the reproof of conscience they are strangers to every sentiment of compassion and are an awful example of the corruption of man when left to himself goodness when i read this kind of a definition when you hear that how do you feel about this um elizabeth and then coming back to this denial how can someone deny what has been written down already well deny uh, when i'm coming back to that the first um description of us was given by roger kipling when he yeah. first came to africa he went back and the description was this uh big huge person with you know with with the eyes on their breasts and you know the the <laughs> ugly half child half devil that for the longest period of time this was uh, the description that came out about us then you have jim crow who came in and now gave we definite the uh, he gave his defined description of what we are and this was basically to make sure that they that the white people saw with what they were dealing with remember that when when the transatlantic trade was happening it was not human beings that were being supported that that was being called as black cattle and as such africans or blacks were always treated as cattle the way you see the breeding which is being done you you have got images of african or black women that were made to be pregnant just like how i start farming and i want to ha- increase my herd so i make sure that i have more women who are going to be producing more children and if they produce the boys i give the boys to the next farmer that needs after just like you see people have dogs and cow and and cats and you know animals when they've given birth up to a certain age those those animals are given out to the other people so this is how we were being treated so denying this is basically and i don't want to i don't want to put the blame 100% squarely on the africans a lot of our school books back home in africa and also here do not have this information as a matter of fact our school books i went and i found out this time that our school books reflect that british people they were the best people that on earth they in fact did away with slave trade but they forgot to mention that they did away with slave trade but they were paid reparations for giving up the trade which the last payment was made in 2015 mm-hmm. yeah for stopping to do the cat the black cattle trade they got an insurance payment and also from the funds from the government in order that they do not they were doing business you just don't stop business and then you you know you turn your capital to zero they had to get money back no i tell you uh, ladies and gentlemen this is really a space to vent a space to talk and hopefully we get healed because i'm already getting sad again now and uh, then it is a space that we after we have been we vented after we've spoken we want to take actions but elizabeth let's go back now we're talking about the african denying the existence of racism i want to go back to the white do we have white people who also deny and use the avoidance strategy yes you have white people that particularly when you look at let me start with the white saviorism these are the people that are going to deny that there is you know there is no racism they are doing their part they are going back home to africa they're going back to africa they're helping some uh, some children 
sending clothes, sending pencils, sending whatever, they are saving those Africans back home. So these are the, the, the classical type of people that are going to deny they are not racist. However, on Monday's newspaper, Professor Dr. Beata Cooper from the Hoshule Nidavai, she's a professor for social, for social arbeit, dealing with group and conflict. She said, and I quote, Yeda tricked racismus in Zish. Everybody, every white person is a racist, whether they be, whether they agree or they don't agree. Yeah. So because simply because the system in which they are in, unless changed from birth, they will never ever have another way of thinking, right? About us, particularly the blacks. They will never because the system is constructed for them in such a way that they are told from childhood, you are white, you are superior. Please behave accordingly, right? So until this is really changed, uh, you are going to find that even the white people are going to have difficulties in venturing to, uh, some of them in venturing and crossing the floor and saying even the word Black Lives Matter. It's a huge thing for some whites to say that because they feel that they are betraying their own when they say that. So it is the same thing when when blacks are denying that there isn't racism. If they are married like myself, married to a white, you feel you are betraying your husband. You feel you are betraying your partner. How can you, it is for them a contradiction. You cannot be married to a white and be an, uh, and say that, yeah, that trick racism is everybody is a racist. It is a contradiction. But yeah. the fact is when somebody, even people who are married they were with whites, they too must must take into consideration that those partners of theirs are to a very high extent racist. Mm -hmm. Right. Until they get to the extent where they have all these open discussions on round tables, discussing and the, and racism is not going to go like that. It's a process. Mm -hmm. Even those partners must learn, start themselves in educating themselves and going in the learning process. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we have Ma, Ma Mambo who is saying that it is a mind game and we must stop letting people define us. Now, uh, yes, I agree with you that we have to stop letting people define us. Um, the definition was made uh, since 19 or since 17, um, 1780, was that 89? Very, 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 very far then. How do we overcome this kind of game? Because uh, now that we know that there is a design, and there's a, a this avoidance strategy. Um, how do we help the people come out of this this um, this hole in which they are? To begin with education. Education, if it is uh, fighting that education systems are changed, education uh, syllabuses are uh, that we pull down the wallpaper. The wallpaper has been painted both in Africa and here abroad, always white. We need to pull down that wallpaper, even if it means pulling down a past bit of that wall to get to the core of what is it that these people designed and these people themselves going in and saying, what is it that we designed? This must happen. But this can only happen if we go through the five phases of grief, or like they call them, the, the five stages of, uh, of grief, because you must remember that psychologically you are t removing people from their comfort zones and you are making them go to another zone where they may not have those strategies, they may not have the tools to be able to cope in that new environment that you're taking them. So mm -hmm. that, that must also be taken into consideration that when we are doing that, have we taken into consideration in terms of informing them? Have we taken into consideration in being that uh, parachute for them so that when they feel they are falling, there is a place where they can go in and be, you know, be captured, be, uh, be, be not be captured, be, be caught so that they do not have a free fall down? No. Mm -hmm. uh, what about my children? If I say this, I've been telling myself th that white people are not bad. What do I tell the children now? Mm -hmm. No. It depends mm -hmm. on the ages of the children. So it is a it's a complex thing. 
Mm -hmm. I know it is a complex thing. Let's go. We have, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome. Thank you so very much. And we have a question from Sila. And um, Sila is asking the question, uh, Ms. Holeman, what is the best definition of racism to a kindergarten child? Wow. I, I, I want to... <laughs> I always want to give the, the right expert to do this because a child has got, the minds are in a different world as ours. You need to break it down to them in the portion that they can digest because it is trauma. We are traumatized with it. So you can expect that if you don't get the right solution, the right method on how to um, to give the information to the children, then you might just be destroying something. What I say from the professionals, Part that I do is you need to give the child a foundation as to where does this skin color come from before you even start talking about those racism. Start off with toys in the toy in the bedroom of the child. Are there toys that look similar to this child? The storybooks are there storybooks that look similar to this child. You need to build a basis before you start talking to the child and then go into those bases to see there is this color, there is that color, this and that. It is an evil topic. I'm not very sure whether I'm the right person to be able to give um, advice on that because the, you need to have somebody who has studied child psychology mm -hmm. or something in that direction to do that. And that person must be black. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, like, I like that point. That person must be black. And um, and I think that it is a very important question. We are still going to work on that. And uh, we are also planning a conversation on that, uh, racism in kindergarten. And we're going yeah. to look for someone who is also going to talk on that exactly. But before then, I agree with you that we have to that uh, we have to reduce, cut the words and put them in ways that can suit the child. We have another question, uh, Mrs. Holloman, from Maria Kainam. It does seem that it is the better educated blacks and the ones with the better positions that are more in denial of racism. Ms. Holloman, what is your opinion? Very true. Very true, Maria Kain. Very, very true. I was very surprised. Uh, I was utterly surprised to come across um, academia group of women who were who were much more in the denial of racism uh, as to how good or bad it is. Does it exist? Uh, to the extent that uh, I'll give you an, uh, an example. The the discussions were. Should we teach our children our mother tongue? For me, mm -hmm. this is not optional, right? Mm -hmm. they, we've learned their languages. We can very well teach children our languages if we can speak mm -hmm. our languages ourselves. So for mm -hmm. me, uh, it was like, whoa, that is the the brainwash. The one mm -hmm. that you, you look at your own language as inferior. You mm -hmm. look at the, the other language to be the one that is going to be lingua franca, that is going to be be used everywhere. But you don't need to, you, the fact that we are doing this, we have killed our languages mm -hmm. across the continent, right? And mm -hmm. once you kill languages, you're killing cultures because mm -hmm. language belongs to a culture, right? Yeah. So, you know, like you, Huma Sekela said, we are the worst imitations of our oppressors. Mm. Yeah. We are the, the late Hugh Masekela from South Africa, the famous musician who used to sing with Miriam Makeba, said we are the worst imitations of our oppressors. Mm. Our oppressor is naturing their culture, naturing their language. We are destroying ours. And that is what uh, what Dr. Chila, Chila Esuboy, who, who now went in and said she is doing more into bringing indigenous knowledge in the school system because she has seen how much damage uh, the lack of it has happened to us because she gave an example for example in Chad apparently uh, they have um, a sort of uh, farming system where they have they dig 20 20 by 20 feet or 20 by 20 centimeter holes and mm -hmm. on the side is where they plant you know the 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 food the mm -hmm. reason why they did this was because this 
holes that they were planting was to capture the water and the plants were going to irrigate themselves taking the amount of water that they want the mm -hmm. other white uh, the other white company that was trying to bring in their knowledge to these people their system was failing dearly mm -hmm. it wasn't working so you can see we have already gone by the fact that we've looked down on ourselves we've not even trusted our own knowledge mm -hmm. we are even destroying our own indigenous knowledge to the extent mm -hmm. that we are going to force see things that work here to work there although the environment the situations are all not the same mm -hmm. so this takes, is very right oh uh, yeah i have had a good conversation with maria and um, we share a lot of uh, common views and uh, we 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 had a conversation on the speech of malcolm x and malcolm x explained exactly the two kinds of slaves and he yeah. said that we have the field slaves and we had the um, the domestic slaves you know so i think that uh, most of us are maybe like the domestic slaves you know we have the the face of the oppressed we have the color of the oppressed the shape of the oppressed but somehow our minds are just like that of our oppressor and if we are not careful we even become worse than them because we have to also defend the privileges of the oppressor and then defend our own privileges this is sarcasm and it is terrible okay we have another question or let's say a feedback from from um Ma, Mama Bo says, racism is voluntarily choosing to remain ignorant about another race. It is a social construct aimed at uh, suppressing or suppressing the other. That's very true. right. I agree with you. What do you think? Very, very true. Um, mm -hmm. There are now books. There are now books everywhere. Somebody mm -hmm. wants to read a book, ask me. They're everywhere. Then studies out everywhere, research out everywhere. Google, you go to Google right now since the George, George Floyd thing, you just put Ray. And the next thing you know is racism all over. You, you <laughs> cannot, you don't have. And mm -hmm. there's experts everywhere. We have platforms now, discussions like these ones, where, where it gives you that impulse to go and find out. There should not be any reason why somebody has not gone out and reread and re, 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 got back to finding out the history. And viewers mm -hmm. out there, my, my appeal to you, if you want to find out about the history, do, that you do yourself a favor, look at who the author is, go mm -hmm. and look at the color of the author, because that, term, that, that like Chimamande Adidichi says, the arrow must be pointed to the right direction. Oh, yeah, you want the to arrow get the must right be pointed story. to the right direction. Yes. Mm. yes. And we have also another question. I think we have a lot of questions today. And uh, Sila Chips is asking the question, how best can, can I, as a parent, create awareness to the children? By being active. Being active, teaching. Um, I remember uh, I've, I've done a lot with Sila. And I remember I told her um, when I realized that my son was suffering from racism, what I did is I went and I took down, I, I got myself history books and I sat down and I suddenly became a teacher. And I decided to teach him the African history. I mean, I must have learned something in school. And as some of the other people must have learned something in school. We have a lot of teachers out here in particularly in Europe or, or even out in the diaspora that may not have job opportunities. Why is it not possible for us using such a tool to get those teachers to offer, you know, those uh, students or those uh, children history lessons to give? Because if you know where you're coming from, you have confidence. If you don't know where this skin is coming from, you lack the tools to, to, you know, to give, to hit back on the people who, you know, the, um, Alice Kester said in her book that uh, these microaggressions, when they come, they're like a mosquito. They come, they bite you, and before you know where it is gone, it's already bitten you and it's gone. No? You don't even have time to attack back or to do, you know, young girl, but... The example which he said, I, she gave, I found it so vivid and it's really true. That is how people experience microaggressions. I'm mm -hmm. talking about a microaggressions. If you don't know, please jump into Google, find out microaggressions, racism. What are those? Right? 
I like the season in which we are, the season of technology, the season that Mr. Google, thank you for giving us these platforms so that we can come and share such discussions and that we can really educate ourselves. But then let's go back now to finding solutions. Uh, Ma says that it takes all of us black and white to fix the issue. Ma, How do you stand together? Yeah, Ma, you've said something very, very important. And I think people who know me have heard me say this. Racism has so many corners and it will take each and every one of us with each and every tool that we have at hand, music, teaching, arts, you name it, will all be needed, will all be necessary for us to attack racism, for us to gain allies. We need those allies because they know where they put the landmines, right? We, we have already got the X-ray uh, the X-ray glasses. We can see where their landmines are. But if they don't have, we need to get them to re-put those land, uh, X-ray glasses to see where they put all those racism landmines so they should remove it for themselves. Because we are not the architects. We don't know which tools they used to build it. They should get rid of it. But it should go. And it will take all of us all of us combined with those racist people to break the system down because everybody is suffering one way or another, even the whites themselves. Right now I've got early white people who don't know how to talk to us. That is again, another trauma. How do I talk? How do I, what should I watch out for? So all this, it's going to take what she said, every one of us in every corner to come together with whatever tools we have to fight it. It is so difficult, actually. I think that even most of my uh, white friends with the death of fluid, I had the impression that some were avoiding and some were very, being very careful what to say, what not mm -hmm. to say. And um, But this reminds me of Pat Parker. I don't know if you heard about her. She was in um, Black American, and mm -hmm. uh, she said that to my white friends, to the white folk who, folks who want to know how to be my friends, the first thing they have to do is to forget the fact that I am black yes. and then on the other hand the other second thing they must do is never to forget the fact that I am black have you heard mm -hmm. this before what do you I think have. about it yes it is very important um I have a saying which goes uh, race is not real but race matters so you need to know that the spaces where you are going to go in I may not, I, I am always going to stand out. So you need to know that you, I am black wherever we go. Like I had somebody who told me, you know, there's this homosexual guy who came and said, now we are going to be experiencing, we experience sort of the same discrimination. No, we don't. We don't. Because he or she who is homosexual, if they go in a room where everybody's white and they don't open their mouth, nobody is going to know that they're white. Yeah. Right? But if I go in a room where everybody is white, before even I went and there's maybe a window, the first thing is going to be seen, mm -hmm. there comes the white person. So we can never be on the same level. So yes, I know that and I, I really like it as well that you, you first of all got to know that I got to remember that I am black. Yeah. And I'm not also your teacher to teach you this how to be um, an anti-racist, that one you have. I can't be the one responsible for teaching you how not to treat me the way, way you're treating me. It, it doesn't mm -hmm. work that way, no. Um, th thank you. And this is always a paradox. I lecture at the University of Esslingen and it's always a paradoxical conversation. I lecture social workers. And uh, so it's always a difficulty because I know the power that social workers and, and teachers are having after they finish their um, the um their their courses and I tell them most of the time you have so much power and so never forget the statement of Patpaka and don't use it only on the case of black people because it is somehow for them paradoxical to see a migrant and yet don't see that migrant like a migrant. So like a migrant. they always have a kind of questioning but how do we go about this? Right. Now let's take the next question. That you you spoke about religion Religion. And uh, it, it is for me, this is a, this is a big space. Um, hmm. What has religion got to do with denial of the fact that racism exists? 
Ooh, yeah. Um, to begin with, I'd like to make my status clear that, uh, clear that I am not into, I, I am not one of those people who are going to be for against religion. Uh, I opted mm -hmm. not to have any opinion on that. What I do yeah. see are the damages that, um, that, uh, the, the side effects, what this religion has been doing, particularly to our African communities in terms mm -hmm. of the supremacy. To begin with, when I'm when I talk about that, I always go specifically on those idols that we have, the white mm -hmm. idols, the white mm -hmm. God, the white Jesus. I saw another video today where a man was dressed like the picture of the Jesus with a blue thing and dancing somewhere in Africa, and everybody was liking him, going on their knees for him. And this is where mm -hmm. I have a problem because um, in the Bible I do not find a place where uh, you know where that is perceived to be the way that they are doing that jesus mm -hmm. is white god is white his angels are white and we are the devils right so when we t uh, take in this uh, the <clears throat> the racial pyramid where the supremists are at the top not the corporates the supremists the mm -hmm. supremacies and the supremists are the top that means we are worshiping the supremacists mm -hmm. because those are the people who believe in white power in white, mm -hmm. uh, you know, white to be clean, mm -hmm. white to be holy and everything. So mm -hmm. all these idols that we have that in the color white, that is where my conflict comes in. Okay. We are actually mm -hmm. uh, uh, praying and worshiping white people and manifesting supremacy because mm -hmm. this is what they are seeing. Whereas we are not seeing that, we are seeing that we, we are transporting something from the Bible to our beliefs. Whereas that is not exactly how it is. How it is that like we've got white Jesus. It's the same thing like all these people, Churchill, the Leopold, uh, that slave guy that was being, you know, those statues that were there. They were worshipped. Those, those statues are things that they are treasured by white people. Not because of anything. For them, they did not do anything bad. Right? Mm -hmm. that, that is my conflict that I have basically with the with the religion. But religion mm -hmm. is a very complex topic. Let me just say. Exactly. Mm -hmm one that um, that when we go and look at the five stages of grief if you take that away from people what are you give, leaving them with mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. this has been something that has been their axis of life mm -hmm. this is something that has that, that has produced for them positive mm -hmm. results mm -hmm. been the solution of when they are down when they are high if mm -hmm. you take it away what are you giving them in mm -hmm. return that is where the problem which brings us to the question before the white men came to the continent, what were we worshipping? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think irrespective of what we were worshipping, I know one thing, and one, the thing that I know is that if there's a supreme being, which is God, he's God, or she's got no color, he's got yes. no gender, and no age. And this helped my daughter. I had, um, I get up very early with my kids and we have always this morning devotion time where we talk and exchange. And one of these days, uh, we that was three years ago, we just got uh, our house in a white sector too. Uh, without, I don't know if it's unfortunate or fortunate. And um, she was the only black girl in the entire school. And so this morning, I don't know why, but we used to discuss about all this. And this morning, I we were reading in uh, the Bible, and um, and I told her that I want you to know, as from today, that you are living. Uh, been and you have no color, you have no gender, and you have no age. Therefore, you can do all things, no matter where you are, and all that. Mm -hmm. And somehow it sticked into her mind. And when she went to school, one young guy told her, Oh, look at your dirty. Your color is dirty. You know what mm -hmm. my girl did? My girl looked at him boldly mm -hmm. and said, No, nope, I am a living soul, a uh, spirit, and I have no color, I have no age, and I have no gender. If you need to see how she when she came back and she told me, she said, Mama, he ran as though he really <laughs> saw his spirit. <laughs> Yeah, we need to strengthen so, our children. And I, I, I think that we can use the Bible to empower ourselves and not make this kind of um, I don't know, use it on the uh, for wrong purposes or again misquote them. 
-hmm. Let's see what uh, Maria Kainas says. Maria Kainas says that the Bible was used by the white people to press Africa, but we use it to liberate ourselves. Oh, yeah. thank you. What do you think, um, Elizabeth? I yeah, like I think, I, I, yeah, I think that if the Bible is used for the purpose that it was designed for, then it can only be used to liberate. But yeah. if it like there is a there is a video somewhere if somebody wants they can check on my timeline where the British person says that some of the chapters of the Bible were actually removed out because mm -hmm. those are the ones that would have made the slaves to free themselves. Mm -hmm. So they left they left those pieces of the Bible that was appropriate for them to oppress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yes, if you use the Bible correctly, and I'm I'm saying correctly. Uh, mm -hmm. then I think that it is a powerful tool. And that is why I do not like to go on there and tell somebody just because I have come to my own conclusions that somebody should mm -hmm. do the same. I don't think it is fair because um, what do I offer them yes. in return? That's what do true. I offer them in return? Nothing. I, I don't have anything to offer them. You're right. So, Elizabeth, we are almost coming to the end of our conversation. One hour is not that long and much. So what do you have to tell our viewers? Uh, just imagine a young person is before you, uh, someone who has never, pre let's pretend has never heard about racism. Let's pretend that we are all denying the fact that it exists. Please tell us, advise us step by step. What do you think we should do? To begin with, word. To begin with, I'd like to tell the viewers, if you've never had, um, you know, you've never had these conversations, you've never done these uh, discussions before, please note that it is not going to be an easy one. To begin with, I will take you and walk you through what I think is important called the five phases of grief. Now, in the five phases of grief, when we are going to look at racism, we are going to, you are going to be denying there is no racism. And we're going to do these discussions. We're going to do the critical discussions. And then we're going to go into the anger phase. That is where some of us are in. We're coming to realize we bought into wrong narratives. We went in and believed into wrong uh, stories that we were told. So we're going to go through the denial phase. We're going to try and bargain. But the white man is really not that bad. Look at what he does in Africa. Look at what, what he's doing this, that, and the other. Then... And this is why I'm saying I cannot take away the Bible, for example, because this is where you get the deep fall. You're going to find some of you are going to go into emptiness, into depression, some sort of a depression, which if it is not uh, captured before or, you know, in, in, with a parachute, you might find that you might actually develop depression. Then, of course, you're going to find yourself being appreciative. Thank God now I know. I can now be able to be uh, to maneuver. I can now be able to navigate. I know what I want to teach my children, for example. I know what is the real truth, and this is what I want to give my children and to empower them so that they too go out with the right tools out there in the world, not, know, not thinking that this skin color has an inferiority. On the contrary, this skin color is the one that is, uh, well, more, more advanced in terms of uh, what we've done previously and how we've built this country for free, all the European countries with the with the with the trade and the colonization, they would have never managed to be on this status quo if it wasn't for the hard work that we did in the U.S. for our brothers and sisters, our black brothers and sisters that worked for 400 years. It's a long time. So I would the, you're going to find that there is where you're going to really appreciate and become also on top of the game when it comes to activists as a uh, as an anti anti racist activist. Thank you so very much, Elizabeth. And then we have come almost to the end of our program, just on time. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to appreciate you for taking your time and to be here. I see you all. I appreciate you. Remember, this is our space. It is a space created by Black people, for the Black people, for awareness, for venting, for talking, exchanging, and of course, healing we want to heal ourselves and then we want to take actions actions that are going to transform us and then transform our environment this is your space we meet again next time next same time uh, thursday next week 
and then you don't want to miss the lady for next week thank you so much all of you elizabeth thank you very thank much you. and have a nice evening have a nice evening Thank you too, and I say goodbye. And this has been your host, Vera Sampon from the Sampon Social Service. Take good care of yourself, and we meet next time, next week, same time. Bye bye.